Thank you. Break with crew 4-3. Engine 6-4-2. Met off our goat. Engine 6 4 two, go ahead. We'll make some official calls on the phone, but if you could contact your division direct, if you're able to disengage from Black Cannon Priority IA, uh, let's get you rolling to uh, Twist River Road, Elbow Cooley Junction. Um, if we could get four safe five one in route as well to help with evacuations in front of the fire. I copy that. And uh, yeah, when actually I got a list of air resources in route. Air Attack 8 for Lima, I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of the switch of frequency to the DNR in Okanagan, and I have that frequency if you don't, if you're ready to copy. We're sending uh, all the folks over Buttermilk and down Libby at this point in time. I'd be advised the uh, wind has shifted and now the, the fire is moving over Elbow Cooley towards the east, northeast direction. Resident on the Swiss River Fire on the east. Nico's broken. I just confirmed there has been an entrapment on it at 721. It's the coordinated to the DNR Okanagan. Did you say that you needed to order life flight or it has it's been ordered already? All life flight and tele services have been requested through. Wednesday morning's forecast for August 19th, 2015, for the area around Twist, Washington, called for temperatures in the low 90s, humidity in the mid-teens, and a Haynes index of 5. The forecast for the Twisp area reflected breezy and unstable conditions, and winds were generally expected to shift to the west or northwest with the passage of a thermal trough. It was yet another forecast that did not call for any real chance of moisture. The grasses in the Twist River Valley showed the bleach blonde look of severe drought. The sage and brush were the distinct dark green that borders on brown and was going to be another hot August day. The colors of late summer had returned to the Methow Valley and the hills that make up the lower end of the Twist River drainage. Ten miles south of the North Cascades Highway, the upper end of the Twisp River flows out of Twisp Lake, nestled among peaks 25 miles west and 6,000 feet above the town of Twisp. About a quarter of the way up the drainage from Twisp lies Woods Canyon Road. The narrow road winds its way less than a mile up a draw on the north side of the Twisp River. The grass of the broader Twisp Valley transitions to timber near Woods Canyon, and houses are interspersed throughout the Ponderosa Pines and Bitterbrush, which was equally dark green in the historic dry spell for the area. Unlike the easily discernible grass to timber transition, the houses in Woods Canyon sit inside an invisible, overlapping interagency fire and emergency service response area. It is a location in north central Washington that's covered by three dispatch centers, one for federal lands, one for state and private lands, and the local 911 dispatch center. Areas of overlapping or intermixed jurisdiction like Woods Canyon are not uncommon across the West given proximity of private, state, and federal lands. Incident responders in these areas of wildland urban interface generally understand that this can delay or complicate radio communication and increase complexity during incident management. It is against this backdrop of terrain, weather, fuels, jurisdictional boundaries, and houses that the smoke report was called in to the Okanagan County Sheriff's Department at 12.23 p.m. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, multiple responders ordered engines, water tenders, crews, dozers, helicopters, retardant planes, and a supervisory aircraft called air attack through their respective dispatch procedures. As with all wildfires, responders that Wednesday afternoon began applying their training to manage the rapidly escalating numbers of resources headed towards the fire. First on scene 
the local fire chief assumed command of the fire. He quickly recognized it was too dangerous to engage along Woods Canyon Road with the limited number of resources that had arrived at this point, and ordered them to work the heel of the fire near the highway. The chief then drove up Woods Canyon Road to evacuate residents. Within the hour, the fire chief was joined on the fire by Forest Service and Washington DNR personnel and established a unified command structure. They verbally agreed on the objectives of life first, then property, and planned to anchor and flank the fire. Recognizing they were limited on personnel possessing qualifications above single resource boss, they assigned individuals as supervisors for each flank and called these people left and right flank points of contact. As the plan began to take shape, the fire was running uphill to the northwest aligned with the wind and slope. Given this fire activity, the left flank was the priority and resources were assigned there first. The left flank resources worked direct fire line near a house and spent their time catching spot fires. The left flank point of contact worked buckets and coordinated structure protection. On the right flank, resources conducted a small briefing as they watched the backing fire from a driveway a short distance from the staging area up Woods Canyon Road. They decided they would be their own lookouts, assigned a tactical frequency to use for communication, and identified an escape route and safety zone down the road to the staging area near the highway. Some of the crew members had come from another fire, and they remembered the briefing there included a weather forecast about a predicted wind shift. Direct line with heavy equipment was assessed on the right flank and a small group of three worked the dozer higher up Woods Canyon. As with many complex initial attack fires, information was lost due to the emerging complexity of the incident. The dozer group's movements up Woods Canyon was not clear to all firefighters involved. While the dozer pushed line where it could, crew members of Engine 642 worked the fire edge and spots near a house towards the mouth of Woods Canyon. Their lead was scouting and identifying places for the helicopter to drop water. This map illustrates the general location of resources across the fire around 1430. From a firefighter's perspective, it illustrates a normal response to any wildland urban interface fire across the west in similar conditions. The responders on TWISP sized up the fire ordered resources based on their expectation of an active fire, evacuated public, addressed lookouts, communications, escape routes and safety zones, then communicated and engaged in implementing the plan. Later, they reacted to the emerging fire by adapting the plan as conditions changed. At 1445, air attack became visible overhead on the left flank. The smoke column was shifting. Shortly after, on the right flank, the wind moved from the southeast to the southwest and felt a bit stronger. The fire's direction of spread changed and moved towards the right flank structures. It was described later as ripping or spreading rapidly, and some had never seen fire move like it did that day through the brush along Woods Canyon Road. The right flank point of contact told all resources on the east flank to head to their safety zone. He noticed engine 642 driving up the road towards him, whistled at them, and directed them to head down the road towards the safety zone. 642 turned around in place and was the first engine to head down. The fire's sound was described like a TV tuned to static and turned full blast. Two more engines followed engine 642 down the road and their crews could not hear anything as they drove. They saw a tree explode with fire, and day turned to night as the fire reduced their visibility to near zero. All they could see was a red glow and smoke as they drove through several waves of fire to get down the road. Their steering wheels were hot to the touch, and they wondered whether their windows were going to explode as they focused on keeping the left wheels in the ditch to help guide them on their way down. The three-person dozer group took refuge from the heat in a garage, while another engine tried to protect the dozer and garage using their bumper-mounted water turret from inside the cab when 
Everything was on fire, and the only thing they could see were the skeletons of the trees burning. The engine crew saw a small opening in the fire and started driving out. Little by little, they drove through what they described as a barrel of fire down Woods Canyon Road. As metal started to fall from the roof and windows began to break, the three firefighters from the dozer group left the garage and ran by the burning house to the road to deploy under two fire shelters. When they looked back, they saw the house and garage were engulfed in flames. The three remained here through several retardant drops. Eventually, drivers were able to reach them. Near the bottom of Woods Canyon, a firefighter ran down the road yelling for help. He was badly burned. He was the only survivor from engine 642. The engine had gone off the road in Woods Canyon. 642 never made it to the safety zone. In the roughly two and a half hours firefighters worked this fire, they were faced with many operational challenges. The same challenges firefighters across the West face every summer. It is clear that the firefighters had good intentions and placed safety as a high priority. They drew from their training and past experiences to make the best decisions they could. But this story still ends in tragedy. The question now becomes why. It's a question that leads to many more questions. How do we build a learning culture? In what ways and to what extent are the conditions we observe at Twisp River common to firefighting operations? Do they represent normal work? How do we prepare to respond to sudden changes that can take place during a fire? How do we recognize, make sense of, and communicate those sudden changes? How do we fight fires differently if there are structures in the area? Should we as an organization and a nation reconsider our tactics in the wildland urban interface? When should we go from life and property to life then property? Whether you are a wildland or structure firefighter, dispatcher, agency administrator, or member of the public, this story involves you. In this ongoing story, you must resist the urge to think that this could not happen to you. You must not allow yourself to become tone deaf to the indicators of a severe fire season. You must discover the complexity of the system that drives events on all of our wildland fires. You must help weigh the risk to firefighters' lives against the risk of losing a home. Each summer, smoke will continue to appear on the horizon. You must not forget this fire, the memory of those who died, or the stories and lessons from those who survived it. Like the uncertainty involved in suppressing any wildland fire, there is no certain mechanism that will trigger this cultural learning. In order to understand this incident from many perspectives, gain a deeper knowledge of this fire, and participate in continued learning from this tragic event, we invite you to join us at the following website.